Hello Computer. This is Hello Computer, a series of interviews carried out in 2023 at a time when artificial intelligence appears to be going everywhere all at once. Our next interview is with Walid Saad of Virginia Tech in the United States. My name is Walid Saad. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Virginia Tech in the innovation campus in, in the DC area. And uh, I work at the research at the intersection of wireless communication. So think 5G, 6G and AI. So how do these two systems come together? And, and we look quite a bit at the, if you want the systems or networking perspectives of AI, so how does AI fit into a communication system? So how does it work and how does it use the 6G and, and beyond technologies? And the reverse as well. How do we use AI to actually improve 6G, 5G communication systems and their applications? Think, you know, connected uh, vehicles, uh, uh, the metaverse and all sorts of applications. And you're also a member of um, uh, at least one major research group, and I'm sure probably more than that. What What's your sense of the pace of change this year? Has it been the same as it's always been, or has the pace of change been particularly fast in the last six months or so? I, I don't think it's particularly fast. It's that that it's just that we now know, about it, right? So we we've known that you know people are working on all these technologies. I mean, generative AI, for example, it's been around for a while. I mean, Ian Goodfellow, uh, I mean, proposed it uh, years ago. Uh, but we're we're seeing we're starting to see actually practical applications that the let's say broader community touches, and that's what makes it look fast in some sense. AI follows in a long line of technology revolutions, as you said, like 5G, 6G, and and various other things. Uh, all of these things require energy, and you've looked at these, this in the past. And so give us the idea of the amount of energy that's required to drive this kind of technology. So, yeah. So you, to think about energy, we need to understand how the technology works, right? So AI essentially has... Uh, we can say three components. The first one is when we do experimentation with AI. That's when we're working without really deploying, with just working in, 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 in a lab, if you want, collecting data and so on. That consumes energy as well, right? So there's some energy needed there to run these, these testing in some sense. But then when it's, once it's ready, there's two phases. One is training. Training means that this AI algorithm should be, uh, should, you know, feed, we feed it data and it should train itself to, to learn on that data. And that requires computing resources, right? This is typically done on a cloud uh, where you have you know, data centers and those require significant energy, uh, not only to turn it on, but to actually run the computation needed for training. And then there's the inference stage, which also uses computing. Inference means when you actually use it, it's deployed in a car, it's actually being used. Now, initially people thought that inference may use less energy than, than, than training. But there are some recent results, I think, from Meta, if I'm not mistaken, that show actually inference may use, need more. Maybe perhaps because we use it more. I mean, when you use it, it's actually a longer time period. Uh, and in terms of sense of, of, of scale, so some works have, see, have shown like training what, what is known as a transformer network with uh, neural architecture search needs like five times the energy to, uh, I mean, of, of the entire lifetime of a car, right? And that's kind of significant. Now, maybe that's, you know, they're, they're inflating a little bit the numbers just to show the scale, but still, it is significant. Whatever the figures are today, are we to expect them to get higher in the future as just more people use it in more cases? Yes and no. I would say yes because of the, you know, wide scale adoption, but no, because we are starting as a community to think of how do we, you know, overcome that? How do you use less computing? I mean, if we're not conscious about the environment, just for the sake of being able to scale that system, right? We need to make it run with less energy, with less resources. So it, we have an incentive to do that. But then you run into a trade-off. How do you reduce energy or computing needs without uh, sacrificing accuracy? Right? I mean, we need it to work properly. We don't need the car to go off the cliff, right? So there's this tra these trade-offs. There's a lot of trade-offs that come into, into the picture. How are those trade-offs working out? So there are results, including from our group and others, that show that, well, you can maintain uh, some sort of, of target accuracy while reducing energy consumption. There are several techniques to do that. One is uh, essentially called quantization, where you use few bits to represent this neural complex neural networks. And with th some sort of, of control, uh, uh, turning the knob, so to speak, of the algorithm, you can still maintain the accuracy you want. 
uh, uh, and there's also this whole idea of federated learning, which Google proposed three years back. Uh, the idea was really to to maintain privacy, right? So they, they don't want to send data over over uh, uh, you know uh, uh, systems. But it turns out that with federated learning, because you're kind of uh, splitting the computing across multiple devices with some sort of quantization, you may be able to reduce the you know the energy consumption or at least spread you know uh, 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 the way or spread the computing across different devices. So there are solutions coming into the picture. I think we're not quite there yet, but but I I, I know there's there's quite a bit of, of of effort being done there. Not to mention that industry may be doing something at large scale that we don't know about in that in that respect. What might they be doing? Do you think? I mean, they could be you know doing this uh, sort of like you know going into very few bits. So at least I heard that some companies may have achieved very high accuracy with like two bits or three bits of precision, which would be really impressive because. I mean, if not for energy consumption, it's the fact that you can fit those on very tiny devices, which means it opens the door for a whole range of applications. What happens if we say to hell with it? Let's let's not bother trying to get things down to very to that two bit accuracy, or let's not let's not worry about things. Let's just let it expand as it's needed to keep accuracy high and to keep the technology flowing and to keep money changing hands. What happens then? I think we're gonna hit a barrier. I mean, uh, the environmental impact is significant. It will be very significant, uh, and not to mention the amount of computing that you would need. I mean, there's the part of 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 AI, and actually every technology called what they call the I think embodied costs, which is the cost of or the, the carbon footprint and the cost to the environment for producing, you know, the data centers, not just for operating them, which we mentioned before, and that is that will be. That would ramp up very quickly if we just keep things, you know, going. And and I think we need to think a bit more on eff- efficient algorithms. I, again, uh, if not for the environment, for the sake of scaling this and making it actually wide, I mean, making its adoption uh, at a wider scale possible. What would you say then to those the tree huggers um, that are sorry the anti tree huggers who are saying that yeah we shouldn't be thinking about this. You're saying that there's, there is a genuine reason here. There's a genuine cause for concern. Yes, yes, there is a genuine cause for concern. And I I mean, I would say we should not, you know, stop the technological advances in the field. I mean, I, I, that's definitely not what we're saying. Uh, we should just, you know, rethink the way we design the algorithms with both, uh, I mean, performance and environmental impact in, in, in mind. And that actually opens up new research questions. So as researchers, I mean, that's a, field that we can look at. I mean, it's a green field for green AI in some sense. You're saying that the, as well as the um, the genuine cause for concern, there's also a benefit of addressing those issues by by just making things more efficient from the get-go. Is that exactly. Right? exactly. I mean, a lot of people now are saying, you know, uh, uh, I mean, sometimes we, let's say, write research papers where it shows that, well, using AI on a drone, I mean, gives you a lot of benefits. But then the concern is that you know, how do you fit it on a computational device that can barely do computation on a tiny drone? So that by itself is is something which, if we solve, we're kind of hitting you know two birds with one stone. We're reducing the the the, the basically computational needs uh, uh, for environmental purposes, but also enabling applications, right? Like you know drones, uh, sensors, uh, all these like tiny devices. I think there's a whole area called tiny ML in in the in the literature. It's well established. Uh, but I think there they think a little bit more on the hardware side, which is great. Uh, and we need to think a bit more at the algorithmic side as well. You mentioned um, uh, federated learning earlier. And so what is what is green federated learning? So this is, uh, we have a project that we've been looking at. So the idea is that when federated learning comes into the picture, again, what are the energy requirements for that system? And that brings in the computation, which we spent quite a bit of time already discussing. But also in federated learning, you have to send information, right? And that brings communication a uh, 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 cost in terms of, of energy uh, and bandwidth as well, you know, this, the spectrum you use. And that's where wireless and AI start to intersect. Because if you deploy this federated learning over 5G, 6G, that is using the energy of, of those systems, which are, uh, yeah, which, which could be significant. So how do you maintain the computation and communication energy efficiency? That's really what we call green FL in some sense, green federated learning. And what are your thoughts on that? What, what are the chances of that being very successful. So we, we, we made quite a bit of strides on that. We were able to show that, well, uh, first we showed what are the knobs you need to turn to actually uh, uh, balance those trade-offs. And in a very recent work, we showed at least that you can uh, uh, have 
computation communication efficient federated learning that is uh, uh, I mean, based on two techniques. One is is quantization I mentioned before, and the other is a known technique in in machine learning called pruning, where you can actually uh, uh, reduce or, or or use a smaller neural network. Uh, we showed that that with combined with federated learning can have also benefits in terms of reducing resource usage. How does this um, all everything that we're talking about now affect the metaverse, which seems to have been put on pause? because AI has taken everybody's attention. Um, so how, how will this play out in the metaverse? In its yeah, so, let me put it into perspective. I think maybe the term metaverse itself is put on pause because of the connotation with Meta, the company, right? Uh, but in reality, I think realistically, there are two components of the metaverse that will come into play and we will use them. One is, I mean, some sort of virtual reality to, to do these interviews, right? If not sending a hologram, right? And, and that will happen. We don't need to call it metaverse. Let's call it digital experience. And the second one is what 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 is known now officially as digital twins, which is you can create a digital representation of, let's say, a vehicle and control it. Those come into the picture, and I mean, ironically, the centerpiece of those is AI, right? Because a digital twin, at the end of the day, is an AI model. It's an AI model of your system that will predict and the evolution of that system and send it back. So all the and 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 virtual reality, you can you know create AI algorithms to represent you, to build the hologram, to the, the avatar, right? So AI, this means more AI. So metaverse, more AI, more AI means we need research in AI. So the circle closes. I I, I think you know there's quite a bit of 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 uh, research to be done at the intersection of the two, and and we've been looking at it again from a communication and systems perspective. But uh, but but that's an interesting area. But again, the term metaverse, we should probably maybe stay <laughs> away from it. <laughs> So, why wireless extended reality is that another phrase and that fits into that or, or um is that not the correct phrase no that is i mean wireless extended reality is i mean extended reality is a term that is well known it's just meant to say a virtual or augmented or a mixture of the two so any type of virtual reality if you want and and when i when we say wireless that's because it's going to be interconnected across many 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 devices and you would need you know 5g 6g connectivity uh so that's I mean, that's probably a, a more, uh, you know, a down-to-earth term for the metaverse, right? It's 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 wireless extended reality. And this is where we go with it. I mean, you said about the down-to-earth, you know, terms. It is a language thing, isn't it? It's, it's you know, people, people, there are technology terms, and then there are terms that us, the public, are comfortable with and will use long-term. And you must be involved quite closely with how these terms are coming around, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How does that work? I mean, you, you're creating the language of the future. Yeah, I mean, in, in some sense, some of those terms come up from, you know, uh, someone has read it somewhere. Like the metaverse, I think it comes back to a book, a science fiction book by Neil Stevenson, I, if, I, if I got the name correctly. So someone comes up with, you know, a new technology and they need to coin a term and then they find something related to it. And typically it's from our past somewhere <laughs> in some sense. Uh, uh, but, 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 yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, I mean, if you want to explain it to the, to the lay people, I mean, at, at the end of the day, think of COVID, right? Or the future of remote work. I mean, imagine that you can do that with uh, a hologram, which captures most of, of the human interaction. And I think that's realistic to say, we want to do it, right? And regardless of what Mark Zuckerberg thinks or what he calls it. What can we, the public, expect with all of the marketing all of the, uh, the, 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 the razzle-dazzle out of the way. What's, what can we expect from um, 6G? And is there a 7G on the cards yet? Is that a thing? <laughs> so, so, yeah, so let's put, put that into perspective. So at first, in, in general, in principle, every what we call G is a, a decade. Uh, I mean, every decade we have a new G, right? So we, 6G target is 2030. Uh, and and then there could be, and there will be a 7G, which is 2040, right? And, so on and we're already working on things where we you know uh, the, the way it works is that this early on we do a lot of research many technologies emerge some of them you know get pruned down and used in the next g others stay to be developed for the next one for example a lot of the research in 6g uh, 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 or early on research is just fixing some of the issues with 5g for example uh, 5g promised very high rates 100 gigabit per second that works in what we call static uh, use cases like you know you're indoor you're walking that's fine but for vehicles for example sending let's say vr to a vehicle at high speed and high rate that's still a big challenge if that's going towards 6g uh, i think in my opinion and at least what we envision for 6g and probably beond is uh, a completely ai-based system where 
you know, the devices actually think and reason uh, and they can uh, talk to each other. Would that make it in 2030 to 16 industry? Maybe not, but that's where we plant the seeds for the next generation, right? And and, and that brings 7G. So I would think 6G in, in, in by itself will allow us to do some of those virtual uh, interactions we were talking about. But let's say sending my five senses, my sense of smell and, and you know, touch and so on, that's probably 7G. And that's where AI meets wireless is probably a, a more, a bigger headline. You've talked earlier about drones and unmanned um, aerial vehicles, but un- unmanned vehicles anywhere on the planet, I guess, are are, are factored into to this, into 6G and whatever comes next. And you just said that they're, the likelihood is that they will be AI first devices, so they'll be independent and thinking for themselves is that right is that is that accurate yeah that that is accurate and and i think uh, there's uh, there's two angles to that one is the devices themselves as as we mentioned will be uh, ai powered and thinking by themselves and i think that's realistic a realistic use case for 6g uh, so meaning how can 6g allow those to work and the technology for them will be done by the AI community, more or less. But there's the flip of the coin, which is 6G itself, or the next G, maybe 7G, will be designed based on AI to actually service thinking machines. So it will be a thinking telecommunication system serving a thinking machines. And that's what I think 7G or the next generation will be. But we should plant the seeds today. And do you think enough has been done reg- regarding the ethics of all of this, the safety um, security. Um, I, I know that you're very close to the, the 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 technical developments, but are enough questions being asked around you know security and ethics? I don't think so, to be honest. I, I think security maybe a little bit more because of its pervasive rev- levels. I mean, you know, uh, defense companies need it. You know, uh, civilian. Need it. So there, security is always a challenge in every technology, and people think about it even though often we are late, right? I mean, it's hacked, then we realize it could be hacked, then we solve the problem, <laughs> which is typically how it's done. But I don't think enough is being done in terms of ethics and, and what you could call responsible AI, uh, primarily because a lot of the conversation is just conversation. I, I don't see technically, you know, uh, 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 concrete solutions, right? Oh, yeah, it should be ethical, blah, blah, blah. But what does that mean? I mean, how do we uh, actually... Uh, design it into the system, very little is being done there. Uh, and I think we should think again a bit more about that, especially when we talk about uh, devices that can think, which again, we're not there yet, but, and they, we will be somewhere there. Uh, so we should be able to, to instill some sort of, of, of ethics uh, in, into the picture. That's fascinating. So what, are you saying that the people are saying we should talk, we should talk, we should talk, but then nobody's talking? Is that what you're saying? I mean, they're, they're talking, but nobody's implementing. <laughs> so so there's, uh, there's too much talk, very little action. <laughs> I, get that. I get that. Or and concrete what, action. And, and, and we're not talking about, um, you know, possible um, uh, fantasy designs. This is not jetpacks in the 1950s. This is, these, this technology is happening, if not right now, within the next few years. Uh, unmanned vehicles that are driven by AI, making decisions for themselves, is not a fantasy it's not a science fiction they're in production now is that right exactly i mean and it's not it doesn't need to have ai as intelligent as a human right which is something everyone is talking about now and that's a great goal to have for the next few decades if we ever get there uh but it's really about let's say intelligent artificial intelligence right so i ai if you want to say and that will happen and that will drive drones, will drive autonomous vehicles. And then there are actually ethical questions that come into the picture. Take a very simple example. There's an autonomous vehicle and there's, uh, you know, it could go off a cliff or hit a pedestrian. What would it do, right? What what should it do? Uh, And these are questions that us as humans are instilled in us somehow. We know what to do in these situations, or at least we take some, the best course of action that we think we should do. Uh, But how do we design that into, a, a, a uh, again, an AI uh, system, we, we need to think more about it. And again, it's not because we think AI will replace humans, blah, blah, blah. I don't think that's even close in the near future, but just because practically there will be AI applications. So we need to be able to design them in a way to be ethical. How many of your colleagues are optimists and how many of them are pessimists, do you think? I, I, I think the, the majority are, are optimists, right? Because we know that technologies eventually filter out and the useful part of them comes in, 
into the real world. I mean, think about the internet, right? Uh, at the time, of course, many people say, oh, this doesn't make sense. No one will use it. And now it's, you know, part of our everyday life. And we, I mean, from a scientific community perspective, we understand that change is incremental and gradual. Uh, uh, so you don't, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, so we, we are optimistic, definitely. It just we need to ask the right questions and we need to kind of uh, converge to, to what will become the eye of the future in some sense. I understand that you are also um, have a great interest in game theory. Um, yeah. Does does game theory fit into any of, of what we're talking about now? Absolutely, because game theory uh, thinks about how rational and irrational agents make decisions, and AI agents are making decisions. Right? How do you? Uh, uh, so there's this field. I mean, to use a technical term called multi-agent systems, which is you know have many AI devices, each of them taking, making decisions. Yeah. How do they, how do we model that? How do we understand what is their optimal or best uh, course of action when they're rational and when there's irrationality? In the past, game theory was used to analyze rational human decision-making, and there were results also showing that humans may be irrational and they don't follow game theory, which brought into the picture this whole field of bounded rationality. I think this whole area can be used to study AI, not just AI, the interaction of AI and humans. Right? So humans making decisions, AI making decisions, they're together. What do we expect to happen? And I think that's where game theory will play a major role. What else should the world be talking about around AI? We should be talking more about the idea of, of let's say, responsible AI, which is an AI algorithm that thinks is ethical and is uh, uh, harmless to humans and their environment in some sense. Uh, and, and that requires uh, not just... Uh, uh, it requires some sort of interdisciplinary research, right? We need to talk to people in ethics because they've been thinking of those questions for a long time. Uh, we need to talk to people again in, in game theory, right? And 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 uh, in co wireless, which which is what what we do. So there's there's a lot of interdisciplinary pillars across this, and I think that is uh, uh, both. Uh, it, it's really exciting. We shouldn't be kind of like scared about it. It's, it's really an exciting time uh, to be in this area, uh, and and hopefully we'll uh, converge somewhere that's as if, as successful as the internet since we talked about that a little bit earlier. Is this a golden age of research, do you think? I think in this area, yes. It's, it's a fantastic, and it, 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 it reshaped a lot of other technologies, right? I mentioned before, like we are wireless engineers. We're thinking, what can AI do for us, right? And which AI do we actually need uh, for, for a wireless system? Uh, which, was, which is interesting because in the past, I mean, I did my PhD on, I mean, I completed it in 2010. And it was on basically uh, machine learning and, and game theory for the wireless networks. At the time, people, uh, the, the, the reaction was always, oh, we don't believe in AI. Right? <laughs> we don't believe AI will play a role in wireless. And now the people writing the standardization bodies, they're talking about what will a quote unquote AI native wireless system look like, which is an interesting change within a decade or so. And I'm, it's, a, it's a welcome change. We've said that it's a golden age for research. Is it a golden age for cooperation between the disciplines, or is it an unprecedented age for cooperation between? It is an unprecedented age, right? Because now we know even more how we can work remotely. And back to the metaverse, I mean, some of those technologies will allow us to to, to work together, right? I'm a faculty in the U.S. Of course, in the past, I used to collaborate with people in across the different countries, but it was, you know, email, and you know, even harder. We have to meet at conferences. Now, you know, with you know, I can say let, let's meet on Friday and let's you know write a paper or, or think of the of, of, of the research problem. And it's it's so easy, right? With people in you know, or, you know Italy, uh, Germany, and all sorts of, of other countries, which is which is great. Do you think society is ready for this though? I, it, it just seems such a dizzying pace of change. And do you do you feel that the people are ready to accept this change, or or, or will they know that that change is? Will they have a say in how that change? takes place? I think there's two parts to the question. One is ready or not. I think we're never ready. <laughs> I mean, people were never ready to use their credit card and you know, they still kept using cash for a long period of time, right? Until it became inevitable. Uh, so we're never ready. And I think we, we you know, which which uh, uh, means that, you know, technology will happen. So we, we should embrace it. The second part is that they should have a say, in my opinion, because once they have a say, that makes them ready, right? The more you give them a say in 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 what's happening and the policy and even the technology, the better it is for for adoption of that technology, right? You know, you need to kind of dissipate the fears. You need to uh, to make sure that people are engaged. And I'll give a very simple example. 
For example, in wireless, I don't think the com- when we talk 5G, for example, I don't think the, the broad community was involved in the conversation at all. And then there was these, during COVID, there were these rumors that 5G creates uh, COVID, uh, which was, of course, ridiculous. But people who have never heard what 5G is, you don't blame them if they think, yeah, maybe that's true, right? So we didn't engage them. They weren't ready. And then all of a sudden, there's, you know, this uh, cool world combined with a real uh, a problem, a real life problem, uh, which created all sorts of, you know, uh, theories and conspiracies at the time. That's fascinating. So if we if action isn't taken by us, you, the researchers, us, the people, politicians, then more conspiracy theories are going to be cropping up. It sounds like. Does that sound right? Exactly. And more, you know, more aversion to the technology is going to be created, right? I mean, someone would say, oh, yeah, I don't understand this. Sounds difficult. No, let me go back to my, I mean, let's take the car as an, as an example. I will drive my car. Just leave me alone, right? I mean, I don't. I don't want some random auto- automata to actually drive my car. Uh, so putting, I think people be engaged in understanding the technology, which I think because of ChatGPT and all the hype around it, that has happened actually in some sense. And that's great to see uh, because people are, you know, talking about it and, and that's great. You must have a sense of how important um, the the changes that we're seeing at the moment are in, in, in with regards to society. For example, is AI becoming a consumer product like the invention of photography? Is it like the invention of the printing press? I mean, Bill Gates has said it's the most startling thing that he's since seen the since the graphical user interface. So, what's your idea about you know where we stand? What's a comparison that we can that we can look to? Yeah, I think a, a, a useful comparison is our move from, uh, you know, physical uh, photography to digital photography, right? Uh, uh, you know, you could take, you know, a couple of pictures or 30 pictures and you have to, you know, buy a film and put it back. And now you can just take thousands of pictures, right? And it, it's so convenient. I think AI will make a lot of things more convenient for, for the consumer. I mean, even maybe a couple of days ago, Gmail was talking about, you know, their auto reply, where it can help you formulate a response to, uh, to, to a certain email. Uh, and those are very useful, right? I mean, even those writing aids that we can uh, now use with ChatGPT, Bard, and others, they're very useful. I use them. Everybody uses them, right? And, and, and uh, we shouldn't be ashamed to use them, right? They, they help a lot in, 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 in uh, many tasks and you know, perfecting things. Mm-hmm through AI is a good thing. Is there such thing as too much convenience? Perhaps. Maybe that leads to a lot of complacency. <laughs> so so perhaps, yes. But at the end of the day, again, when you when something new comes up, some a, a new challenge comes into the picture, right? So it, it, it never ends for us uh, in, in, in research and science. So I think, yeah, you get convenient with something and then something disrupts it and then you kind of, you know, go back to zero in, in, in many ways. So we're waiting for the next technology revolution to disrupt the convenience revolution that that we might be seeing in the very near future. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Well, in te- well, we'll tr- we'll keep trusting technology. We will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The energy requirements. Um, how would they compare to, for example, crypto mining? I think they're 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 comp- I mean they're comparable, right? Because it's it's all of this are using computing resources at the end of the day, right? We can you, you can forget what is being done and you can think of computing as a resource. And the more you use computing, the more you use energy, and that opens up this whole, you know, vicious circle in some sense. And and, and that it is what it is, right? You need we, we need to design systems that use less computing uh, and to free up our computing resources. My, it's my understanding that some of the uh, the crypto mining server farms that have been used in the past um, to do that work um, are now being repurposed for AI work. Um, so have you heard anything about that? I mean, that could be the case. I, I don't know of, of you know specifics, but but why not, right? At the end of the day, as I mentioned, this is uh, you just need to do computing, right? And and wherever you can find a computing. Uh, uh, a resource that's vacant, you can use it. Which brings me back to the point early on, even if we don't care about energy, the less we use computing, the more applications we can fit into a server, right? And, and that's an advantage. What about uh, biological computing? Will that help at all with the uh, with, with, with computer requirements? Yeah, so I, I think designing systems that mimic the biological uh, uh, neurons or the biological brain 
are more energy efficient than what we have now. And I think that's an idea that's being explored. I'm not the expert, but some of those uh, 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 people are trying to think of designing hardware that actually does that, uh, that's closer to a uh, biological brain. And that, at least early on results, show it's more energy efficient or more efficient in the general sense. Uh, and and we know that I mean in some sense humans we are more energy efficient uh, when we use of course our our brain computing resources than uh, uh, than a computing device. And again, it, it makes us come closer and closer to humans and technology being the same thing almost in the future. Which I guess begs another question about you know we we need to be talking about this if we're turning ourselves into biological computers. I don't think I don't think that's the right way to look at it. I think the better way to look at it is that uh, the fantastic way in which uh, humans uh, think and 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 work is inspiring a lot of research. So we are inspiring, uh, you know, new hardware. We are inspiring new algorithms, and that's great. I mean, they will never replace us, but but if we can mimic some of our functions uh, uh, in, in in technology, why not? That that helps. Subscribe to the Hello Computer channel here on YouTube to hear more interviews with experts as the world comes to terms with thinking machines.